Um, has everybody signed the book? The reason I ask is because at the state level, we get credit for every person who attends our meetings. So if you didn't sign the book, run back there and sign the book to be sure that we get credit for you. If you would like to get our emails, like our newsletters, and you don't already get those, uh, you can put your email address down and you will be added to our email list. There's no obligation, it's free, and so on and so forth. <coughs> um, when you sign the book, you should get a red ticket, and that's good for our raffle. At the end of the meeting, after the program, we have a raffle, and the items that are available are there on the, uh, the counter over there. We have a few plants. The, the long uh, planter has rouge plant in it. They are a shade loving plant. They get white flowers and red berries, and they're uh, kind of picky sometimes, but if you have a shady area, you're going to like the rouge plant. And there are individual plants in there. Don't pick them. <laughs> there are also a lot of donated books, uh, gently used books that have come from our members current and past. And um, they're all good books. You'll enjoy whatever you pick up. Okay, coming events are on the back of the agenda that you have on some of the seats. I didn't make it out, sorry. So you may have to share with your neighbor or your spouse or your friend or whoever you have here. Uh, but there are several upcoming events. There are walks, there's our next meeting, and our May meeting. Our main meeting will be a BYOP that is bring your own picnic. We are doing that now instead of a potluck. Just pack yourself a little sack lunch. Uh, the meeting is still at one o'clock. It will be May something or other. <laughs> the second uh, Tuesday in May at one o'clock right here. And that will be followed by a uh, question and answer, uh, garden hints, um, questions that you have and some of our expert growers here will try to answer them for you. So yeah, it'll be a fun meeting. There isn't a real formal program or a speaker as such. It's just a casual get together where you can socialize with uh, other people who love the plants. Um, okay. Is Our program has just arrived. <laughs> Ruth, if, if you'd like to uh, lunch, lunch, Josh gets organized if you'd like to introduce him. Sure. And be sure to stick around after the program for the raffle that I just mentioned. So, in the meantime, we're gathering volunteers for next Plant Native Day to the um, Plant Production Committee needs help starting pretty soon. So if you think you might be interested, stop and see me after the meeting and um, we really need to start planning earlier than we did last year to make it a bigger success. Uh, there's all different things you can do. You can help with propagation, maintenance, um, discussion about what you want to carry and how many types of plants. Um, even if you don't know anything about native plants, it's a great way to learn. And yeah, she has some time. Since there's several uh, new people raised their hand, or uh, I guess I guess you could say, can you just go over a little bit about what the setting up of the mangrove chapter and just about what, what your organization does? Um, I'm Linda. <laughs> I said there's several of us that raised our hands. It was our first time here. Oh, sure, I'd be happy. Well, obviously, our, our passion is native plants. And the reason we are so dedicated to native plants is because if you want wildlife in your yard, if you want pollinators in your yard, if you want butterflies, bees, uh, little wasps, not the stinging kind, you're going to have to have native plants. All of the animals that are local to the area evolved for hundreds of thousands of years with native plants. They only lay their eggs and feed their young specific plants. Everybody knows about monarchs. They only lay their eggs on milkweeds, 
Their caterpillars can only eat milkweeds. So if you don't have native milkweeds, you're not going to have monarch butterflies. The same with uh, swallowtails, the same with adult fritillaries. All of these animals depend on native plants. Uh, gopher tortoises, they eat uh, sunshine, summer, sunshine, sunshine mimosa, they eat gopher apple. All of these are native plants. Uh, so many other animals, they depend on native plants. If you bring in exotics, if you have a yard full of hibiscus and ipsia, and you wonder why you don't have butterflies or you don't have bees, that's why. These creatures don't even recognize ipsia or hibiscus as food. Even though to us they look like flowers, even though ipsia is so easy to care for, it blooms forever, you can trim it to death, um, it never gets out of control, you're never going to find a butterfly or a bee on Ixia because to them it might as well be on you. So if you don't have native plants in your yard, um, you're just plain not going to have wildlife. Birds are the same. Birds eat the berries of these native plants. Um, they eat holly berries from the holly tree. They eat beauty berries uh, from the beauty berry plant. Um, I believe they can eat nightshade, which is a native plant, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, toxic to us. You're not going to die from eating one, one uh, nightshade berry, but you know, I, I wouldn't uh, make a soup or a salad out of them. Um, that's then, yes. We have outreach, you know, the Cedar Point Park coming up, and then you can walk and dive and walk. Yes, we have. It, it varies, but we have usually three or four guided walks per month in season. Um, out of season, during the summer, it's just plain too hot, you know. Sorry, but even at 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning, it's just plain too hot for walks. So we take the summer off, but we have meetings from October through May. We have guided walks from about the same period, October through May. Sometimes it's November before our walk leaders get back. Uh, but we have all this outreach. We go to events, like we will be on Earth Day, which is the 22nd. We will be at Cedar Point on the 28th. We will be at um, the People for Trees Tree Fair in honor of, no, I'm sorry, that's the 29th. The 29th. People for Trees Tree Fair at uh, Northport City Center Green. Alice White, who has run People for Trees since like 1997, makes available native trees at ridiculously cheap prices. $15 for um, three gallon trees and $25 for seven gallon trees. That is an absolute steal. Um, so if you're interested in having a tree for your yard and getting something to replace what Ian has blown down, be sure to make it to the tree fair. On the 29th, the Charlotte County Master Gardeners Association has an event at uh, Centennial Park in Port Charlotte. At that event, um, there will be a lot of other organizations besides us, but you can get a free Florida elm tree. You do have to attend a 10 minute presentation on how to plant a tree, but otherwise you get a completely free Florida elm tree. Um, so again, you can you know, do that. More questions? Okay. Yes. On the 29th anniversary of tree sale, yes. is there a list of doing um, trees for Canada available? No, I'm sorry. Go online to People for Trees. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. All right. I'm really happy to introduce Captain Josh Olive. He's a fifth generation Florida native. He is the publisher of Waterline Weekly Magazine and host of Radio Waterline on KIX County 92.9 FM. Josh has spent 40 years learning about Florida's wildlife and ecology and is a fisherman, harper, herper, photographer, and 
Florida master naturalist. Today he will be sharing his knowledge with us through his amazing photography on insects. Let's welcome Captain. Thanks, guys. Uh, does anybody know what a herper is, by the way? No. <laughs> it's, it's not somebody who has herpes, okay? A herper is somebody who goes out and looks for reptiles and amphibians. So herping is kind of like bird watching, except that we're looking for snakes, lizards, turtles, that kind of stuff. And one of the big differences between bird watching and herping is that bird watchers are usually discouraged from catching the birds. In herping, we very often catch the animals and observe them very closely. Um, mostly it's catch and release. There are some herpers out there who keep what they catch, but that's not what we do. So today, though, we're not talking about herps, we're not talking about birds, we're talking about insects. That's something that if you're going to be a plant person, you're just going to have to learn to deal with. Whether that's a positive or a negative depends entirely on your point of view. So a lot of people get very upset about insects out there because they're plant lovers, then you've got things like caterpillars that come along and munch on your leaves. You've got things like wasps and bees that can be very distracting while you're trying to enjoy flowers. But I try to take a more holistic view of nature. All of these animals are out there, they all exist for a reason, and they all have their purpose. So <coughs> we are going to start with equipment, and I'll show you how I'm getting these insect photos. So I use a couple different setups. The first, and it's not about the camera itself, but it's more about the lens and the light. This is my casual setup. This is a 100 millimeter Canon macro lens. This is a Canon flash, and I've got a diffuser on. The diffuser is really important if you want to get good insect photos because a lot of times you're taking them from pretty close up, so it's easy to blow them out. Uh, anybody here do any macro photography? So this is kind of typical macro photography in that I'm trying to push up my f-stop as high as it'll go so that I can have as wide a depth of field as possible. You'll notice in some of these photos that they have very shallow depths of field and that's just uh, something that happens when you get very close to things. So I'm trying to make the depth of field as wide as possible so that we can see as much of the insect as we can. But if you fail in that or you have to use a shallow depth of field, it's just like any other wildlife photography. Get the eye. The eye is what matters. If you have that in focus, the rest of it is pretty much forgivable. If you have the whole rest of the thing and you miss the eye, then forget about it. So it's just not gonna happen for you. So this is setup number one. Uh, I've started using setup number two a little bit more often, which is a longer macro lens and also a dedicated macro lighting system. One of the problems with macro lights is that if you're way up here with a flash, it's very difficult to get the light on something that's right here in front of the lens. But if you put the lights right here in front of the lens, then that simplifies it. So these are the types of dedicated systems that we're using to take insect photos. However, I recognize that a lot of you are not going to be willing to spend the money on those kinds of systems. So we're also going to talk about this. Yes. <laughs> Thought like that. So we have a whole section of slides that we're going to go through of photos taken with this. Now, I did, when I bought my phone, make sure that I got one that had a pretty good camera. It's not an Apple. This is an Android. It's an S20, Galaxy S20. Uh, it's got a pretty good camera on it. A lot of phones out there have pretty good cameras on it. But if you're interested in taking photos, whether it's plants, bugs, birds, whatever, just do a little research and find one that has a pretty good camera in it. The Apples have good cameras, the Samsung Galaxies have good cameras, there are a few others out there that do also. All right, so let's get started looking at some photos. Now, I encourage questions and commentary throughout this. However, we do have about 90 slides to get through. So the more you talk, the longer this takes. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what we're looking at here? Yes? Is this Saranus blue? It is a Saranus blue. And would you care to gender this butterfly? I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Being as blue as this one is, this one is a male. A lot of insects, you can tell whether you're dealing with males or females based just on their appearance. Not all of them, but a lot of them. 
And Serratus blue is one that's pretty easy to differentiate because this bright blue color doesn't exist in the females. You may get a little bit of blue flash or a bit of iridescence off the top of the wings, but it looks nothing like this butterfly does. These guys are tiny. If you guys have seen these while you're looking at plants and while you're wandering out in the outdoors, they're very small. I mean, this is maybe the size of my thumbnail. And they usually fly pretty low. So don't expect to have these things flip past you at eye level. If you're not looking down, then you're probably going to miss the Serratus blues. And here is the female. Now, if you look, she has just a touch of blue where you see the, the wings overlapping. Uh, right in this area here, right up here, there's a little bit of that iridescent blue. And she also has a little bit of iridescence in the fringe on her wings, but not much. You wouldn't probably call this a blue butterfly if that's what they all look like. But because the males are so astonishingly blue, that's where we get the name from. Some people actually would mistake these for being a whole separate species, but they're not. They're just the girls. Anybody recognize this one? It's one that we don't see a whole lot down here, and it doesn't have a whole lot of relatives down here either. This is a little metal monk, also a small butterfly, maybe a little bit bigger than the Serratus blue, but not much larger. Uh, this one was spotted on a root pipe in the web in Punta Gorda, and I did not see it, someone else did, and I'm glad that they pointed it out because I probably would have never seen it. <clears throat> but it was flying very low and very short little hops around the plant, and it probably would not have caught my attention. But now that I know what to look for, I've seen several of these little metal marks since. You won't mistake it for probably any other butterfly. There's nothing else that that's, that's that size and that orange. So, a very pretty little thing. What was it called? Metal a mark? little metal mark. Metal mark. If you look at, in person, well, hang on, those, those lighter markings on the surface, they do have a little bit of a metallic look to them. And some of the white the markings underneath also have a metallic look to them. So they get the metal mark named above that. If you're from up north, you may be familiar with other metal marks, and especially out west, but this is the only one that you'll see here in Florida. Anybody know what that one is? You guys don't know a zebra swallow. You guys don't know bugs. <laughs> so a lot of people respond very positively to photos of butterflies. Everybody likes to see them, they're pretty, they have nice colors, they don't feel dangerous in any way, so a lot of people respond very well to this. If you want to make friends and influence people through your insect photography, I definitely suggest butterflies. Butterflies, however, can be a little bit hard to approach. So in this particular case, this swallowtail was buzzing around everywhere. As soon as I tried to follow him, he moved someplace else. And that's pretty typical for a lot of these butterflies. So what I found instead is that it's better to be in the area where they want to be and just let them come to me. So to get this photo, I just literally laid down on the ground and pointed the camera at a plant where I'd seen him land half a dozen times. And I said, if he stays in this area, he's coming back to it. And sure enough, about five or six minutes later, he came right back to it. So I could have driven myself nuts trying to chase this thing around all day, but if I just let it come to me, there we go, and we've got the photo. What plant is that? Uh, you know, I'm only this much of a plant nerd. Oh. <laughs> I figured you guys are like a pure plant nerd in this. Right. So I was kind of wondering if maybe y'all would sell me. <laughs> <coughs> Be. There's a lot of Spanish needles in that area. I don't remember specifically if this was a, a Bidens or not. Um, I, I love hanging out around Bidens Alpines. It's just a great place to find bugs. So, you guys will certainly identify some of these plants though as we go on. That one definitely is a Spanish needles. And this is a favorite of everybody. Monarch butterflies. Everybody just loves the heck out of these things. I, on the other hand, feel a little bit differently about it. And it's not that I don't like monarch butterflies, they're fantastic, but so are all the other butterflies, and so are the wasps that prey on the caterpillars. I get a little upset when people start picking winners and losers based on what they think is pretty out there in the wild. You know, what they think 
is a beautiful plant that's worth keeping versus a weed is just dependent on their own personal judgment call. And they make the same calls with insects. If you don't have the balance, if you don't have the predator and the prey, if you don't have the beautiful flower and that ugly weed you think, then you don't have a balance in nature anymore. We need to strive for that balance rather than say, here's something that I really like because it's so pretty. And I'm gonna pick that to be the winner and every loss that comes along I'm gonna kill it. It's just not a very good way to look at nature as far as I'm concerned. I understand that I'm in the minority. Here are monarchs making more monarchs. Um, <laughs> you'll see things like that occasionally. This one was a little bit farther away than I like to take photos. This actually was not taken with a macro lens at all. This one was taken with a 500 millimeter burning lens, believe it or not, because they just wouldn't come down out of the tree. So sometimes having longer lens options makes it a little bit easier. Uh, if I tried to take this particular image with a cell phone, we would just have a little orange blob out there at the end of what might be a stick. So sometimes happenstance just brings you things that you weren't expecting, and that's what happened in this case. Do we know that plant? Frog fruit. Frog fruit. Frog fruit. Yeah. And one that you're probably used to seeing a lot smaller than it is on the screen yet. <laughs> so if you recognize the plant and know its size, then you also recognize the size of this little moth. This is a red-waisted florella moth. And if you hang out in areas where there are frog fruits, you will certainly see these little guys. Again, a low flyer and a small animal. So a lot of times you'll disturb them by walking through the area and the next thing they do is they land, but they land on the underside of the leaf. And a lot of these little moths and butterflies will do that. So it can be very difficult, very challenging to get a decent photo. As you can see from this angle, clearly I am not standing to take this photo. This is a photo, again, taken from a lying down position. If you're afraid to lay down in the weeds, then a lot of these insects are going to be difficult to photograph. So I'm absolutely not afraid to just lay right down in them, and no matter the looks I get, I'm trying for something here. So, red-waisted flora. Another Bidens. So again, we see this is not a large insect by any means. When I first saw this one, I didn't think it was a moth. I thought I was going to be taking a picture of a beetle. But this is a black dotted sprachia moth. It's something that I've actually never seen before taking this picture. They imitate beetles because I guess beetles are less prone to predation. And having that bright orange coloration makes you an orange and black beetle, which probably has some kind of toxic qualities. Sprachia moths do not have any toxic qualities whatsoever and are perfectly edible. But by imitating a beetle that probably has a distasteful, toxic, bitter flavor, then he's less likely to get eaten. So, a little bit of And I don't see these often, I've only seen two or three cents. Hey, look at that, another Biden's album. Uh, anybody recognize the, the butterfly here? It is a hair streak. Do you know which one? Red banded hair streak. Until I started getting more into these guys, I never realized how many types of hair streaks there are. It's ridiculous how many of these things there are, which is probably because their little trick is quite successful. If you look at this butterfly, you can see he's got an odd posture. He's head down. This is typical of hair streaks. They often perch this way. And in addition to their head down posture, what they'll do is they'll rub their back wings together. And if you notice, he has little thread-like appendages on the back of the wings. And as he rubs his back wings together, those waver around like antenna. However, his actual antenna are just standing still, pointing straight down. So if you are a hungry bird, and you're trying to find a butterfly for lunch, then you might think that that's the top end pointing up, when it's actually the bottom end, and it's just the wings that you're gonna grab and you think you're grabbing this thing's head. So you see quite a few hair streaks out there that are missing the back portions of their wings, and yet the animal itself is still intact. So obviously this trick only works once or twice, and if your wings get ripped off, then that's not a good day for you, but at least you survive and maybe you have a chance to reproduce. Now, take a look at the pattern on this guy. Look at where the orange is, and then look at this one. So similar, 
but not the same. Well, you all saw it. It was there, right? <laughs> that one was a gray hair streak. The, the one that has a lot less orange on it is the gray hair streak. And we may have this issue a couple times here going forward. Um, when I played this last night, I noticed that a couple of the slides had gone white. But then when I went back through it, they were all there. So if we missed one, we missed one. We got plenty here. This is a, a Bayon Crescent. Uh, again, another fairly small butterfly. A lot of the butterflies that we have around here are going to be small. People will pay attention to things like the big tiger swallowtails or giant swallowtails that are coming through, or the, the very pretty bright yellow sulfurs. The problem with all those butterflies is that they're big and they're fast and they like to fly high. This makes them much more difficult from a photography standpoint, even though it's a larger target. So by shooting for the little guys, the ones that tend to stay lower, like knee height or less than that, they also tend to stay in an area a lot more. So you have multiple chances to approach and to make a photo of it. Now this one is taken with a very shallow depth of field so that you get that very creamy, blurry background. If you would look at this with your eyes, it would have looked totally different. And some people would say that this looks almost photoshopped. That's done in camera to make it look like that. Now that is an interesting way to take a photo, but another interesting thing to do with it is to take it from a different angle. Same butterfly, same position, just this is a Phaon Crescent. Phaon. Phaon Crescent, P-H-A-O-N. The only difference is that I moved. So instead of standing above it, I laid down in front of it. So this gives you a totally different perspective on that animal versus what you would expect to see. The first one is great for identifying species. The second one gives you a sense of personality, individuality. Is the first one covered with pollen or debris, or how come it has a little... It has that dusty look to it? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes that's a, a function of a flash. You'll sometimes get some iridescent scatter back at you. But in this case, that butterfly is nearing the end of its lifespan and has already lost quite a few scales. So instead of having the, the almost black color that a freshly metamorphosed band crescent would have, this one is looking a little bit gray. I was surprised his wings were in such good condition for having been grayed out. But not everything can be butterflies. We have to deal with some other things too. So I gave you the butterflies to kind of get you into it more softly. Now we're going to get into the things that everybody tries to avoid. But I think this one in particular, it, it almost reminds me of a cartoon character with those eyes. Uh, this is a leaf cutter bee. I can't identify it to species. Uh, Identifying a lot of these things to species gets to be very difficult. I'm sure you guys deal with that in the plant world too, where you have species that are very similar or closely related to one another, and in some cases you'll have dozens of them, and that's where we're at with the leaf cutter bees. And they're identified by things like the, the shape of a metatarsal, which doesn't appear in this photo, or some pores on the abdomen, which don't appear in this photo. So sometimes you just aren't able to tell. You can get a fairly good idea. So this is one of the leaf cutter bees, and it only looks like she's looking at me. She's actually not. Um, a lot of people freak out about the bees and about the wasps, but I found that if you're in an area where they're feeding, they're absolutely no danger at all. And in most cases, these are non-stinging bees anyway. Uh, leaf cutter bees, as far as I know, don't sting. They certainly have the opportunity to sting me, and they haven't. This one, which is a brown wing striped sweat bee uh, also does not sting as far as I know. Uh, this one is a female. You can tell because she's got a fully green abdomen. We'll see a male here in a minute assuming that slide works. These guys are actually attracted to you and we have several different species of sweat bees here. The reason they're called sweat bees is because they have a salt crater and if you've got a little bit of salt on your skin then they may land on you and lap it up. Uh, I have walked through flowers with my aunt, and she has been lapped by dozens of sweat bees, while zero have landed on me. So she says that's evidence that she's sweeter than I am. <laughs> I said it's just because she's a lot more salty. 
<laughs> but these are beautiful. The metallic colors are just fantastic. Uh, and these are also beautiful. This is a green orchid. If you see one that's hovering, it's much more likely to be an orchid bee than it is to be one of those sweat bees. And orchid bees almost have a, more of a teal color to them than the sweat bees, which are a true yellowish green color. Uh, really pretty little insects. I had one of these uh, a couple days ago and just kind of stare me in the eye for about 15 seconds before it decided to fly away. But I can pull one across them every now and then just, and they're cool. The important thing is, if you hear something buzzing nearby, don't freak out because this kind of stuff is what gets people stuck. You're going nuts and setting off whatever defensive mechanisms this animal may have. It's got a stinger that makes it much more likely that it's going to use it. If you just maintain your tree like atmosphere, then you don't have any kinds of problems. This is a mud dauber, a black and yellow mud dauber, and she is collecting material for her nest. You can see she's biting pieces of this vegetation off, and that's going to be used to build one of her nests that she's going to keep her offspring in. Later on, she'll go out and collect some spiders, which she will put into that nest that her offspring will be able to feed on. But right now, she's just building. She's not actually collecting any kind of food. And again, it's very close to this wasp, because this one does have a stinger. And she showed no aggression, no inclination whatsoever towards being aggressive. When I got too close, she let me know by just walking away. This is one of our digging wasps. Has anybody ever seen wasps digging out there. This one, this one is, uh, doesn't even have a common name. Uh, it's just a narrow-waisted wasp, but there are dozens of narrow-waisted wasps. The Latin name on this one is Sphex or Salus, and it's a pretty good size insect that may be an inch and a quarter long. So again, a lot of people would be scared of this thing. It doesn't have a nest to defend. It doesn't have any reason to go after you. You can get pretty close to them, especially when they're digging their holes because they're not going to abandon that hole. She's going to stick with it. And if you don't seem like you're trying to get into the hole, which I wouldn't suggest that you stick your finger down there, then she has no reason to assume that you're any kind of a threat. So why go after you? Why is she digging the hole? She is digging that hole because she is going to place her egg down there. So that is her form of a nest. But it's not like a paper wasp nest, where they all are in defense of that. So usually if you have solitary wasps, even if you did disturb their nest, they'll just leave because she can make another one. This is not her only hole that she's gonna dig. She's gonna dig 50 holes and she's gonna put one egg in each one. So it's a, the idea of not putting all your eggs in one basket. She's right up there with it. Now we're dealing with wasps and bees. So you might think that this photo is misplaced because now it's a caterpillar. But this photo is not misplaced. This is actually a photo of wasps. Does anybody see the wasps? <laughs> so this poor caterpillar has been parasitized by, let's see what they're called, Cotesia congregata, which is one of the hornworm parasitoid wasps. And these are the cocoons that are on its back. So they have already been inside the caterpillar. These are not eggs. They have already eaten a bunch of the inside of the caterpillar, and now they are metamorphosing into these cocoons. <coughs> so the caterpillar is going to die as a result, but he needs to carry those cocoons around for a little while. So once the wasps all hatch, then the caterpillar can die as a result. Nature is weird. Here is the male of that brown ring and striped sweat bee. And you can see that he has a much more bee-like look because of his yellow abdomen with the black band around it. A lot of people, again, freaked out by these things because they buzz around you, but just chill out. He's not here to hurt you. He's just seeing if you are salty enough to be worthy. Now that one, on the other hand, could stink. This one is a horse paper wasp. It's the largest of the paper wasp species that we have down here. It's also bright yellow, so it's easy to notice. Again, collecting nesting materials here, that paper that they build is not made from wood most of the time, it's usually made from cellulose and leaves. So she's out here and she's already been to this leaf several times. 
Uh, you can see the bites that she's taken out of it. There's something about this particular week that tickles her fancy. So she's going to be bringing that material back to contribute to the nest that she and her sisters are building for the queen. And again, she's not in defensive mode at all. She was very docile towards me, even though I got far too close to this one. That is not docile. <laughs> this is uh, Hunter's little paper wasp, Callistes dorsalis. And anybody know what that look means? Get away. Oh, what that look means. <laughs> There's not much question about what that look means. So, yeah, and I did get pretty close to her, but again, they, they'll tend to dive bomb you first before they start to sting you. And in this case, I was approaching slowly and quietly, so I didn't appear to be much of a threat. She looked at me, and three seconds after this photo was taken, she turned and looked the other way. So she was looking for a threat. She didn't see it in me. And it's because I approached fearlessly and quietly and not in a threatening manner. That's everything when you're dealing with these animals. So I do not recommend my way doing this. <laughs> this is an example of things that just happen to happen while you're taking pictures. Now, this is not a particularly great photo. This is a three banded scolia wasp, a fairly common species that we see out there. This is, uh, I forget what this plant is, but I'm told they're not native. Um, some of you might recognize it. It's got these little balls of, of flowers on the ends and spikes. Um, but anyway, not a fantastic photo, but when I went and reviewed the photos, I discovered something about this photo that was very, very interesting. Did anybody see it? How about I zoom in and show? So that's some kind of ant. I don't know what kind of ant. It's hitchhiking on the tail end of a three-banded scolia wasp. So I showed this to an entomologist at the University of Florida, and I said, hey, does this kind of thing happen regularly? Is this a species that you can identify for me? And he said, I've never heard of that happening ever, anywhere, ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see all kinds of weird things. I got the proof. There it is right there. So what was it doing there? I don't know. How did it get there? I don't know. And that's not the only hitchhiker that we have a photo of. This is actually fairly common where you'll see insects land on other insects, especially around areas where there's a lot of activity going on. And I don't take too many pictures of honeybees. I'm not anti-honeybee, but there's a bazillion pictures of honeybees out there. But this one with the little fly land on it I thought was interesting, so I snapped that shot. And again, honeybees, when you're in those areas, people warn me about killer bees and how dangerous they are if you're near the nest site. Yeah, I'm sure they are if you're near the nest site, but again, if you're out among a field of flowers and there are bees out there, they're not going to come after you. They're just not. They're very calm. They're very docile. They have no reason to sting you. And honeybees in particular, which only get to sting once, not like wasps, but they hammer you 50 times. But a honeybee only has one shot in her life. And she is not going to waste it on you just out in the field of flowers. Not every photo turns out. <laughs> Sometimes you're just going to miss it even when you think you have it. In this case, I had been shooting something else and my shutter speed was far too slow to get this, I think, deep cut of view. But it is interesting, it does show you the speed of this thing, right? This is a mason wasp. It does not have a common name. This is Zetha spinifes. And she has that beautiful blue coloration, iridescence all over her body. I've only seen a couple of these. It's not a common species. We have a lot of different species around here. And that's one of the cool things that draws me in to taking pictures of these animals is that I'm constantly finding things that I haven't seen before. There's always new stuff out there. That one's not actually a bee, but this one freaks people out just as much. This is Cystoecus solidus, which is a type of bee fly. So they kind of look like a bee when you see them bumbling around slowly, but they're not bees at all. And this one says, how do we Moving in towards dragonflies. Dragonflies 
are highly obvious and make fairly good photo subjects. Uh, a lot of times, if I'm looking along a barbed wire fence, I see insects of all kinds. But it's kind of like taking bird photos on a wire. Yeah, you get the bird or you get the bug, but the background is not the greatest. So if you're just getting started with taking insect photos, there's absolutely no problem with taking photos of bugs sitting on barbed wire, sitting in unnatural places, just because they're easier to spot. But as you get more into it, uh, I suggest looking for more natural settings to take your pictures in. They just look better when you have them sitting on something that naturally occurs rather than sitting on barbed wire or something like that. The previous dragonfly was a blue dasher. This one is a Halloween pennant. Both are pretty common species around here. Uh, Halloween pennants in particular are pretty easy to spot. They get their name of pennant because they often sit like this one is right on the tip of a twig. And so the wind will blow them around a little bit and they kind of look flag-like while they're up there. Uh, occasionally you'll see a field that will have 30 or 40 of these Halloween pennants all decorated in the tip of a tall piece of grass or a twig out there. I do not have a species identity on this dragonfly because there's not really much to identify it as a species with. But this is kind of a cool photo that shows the multiple eyes of the dragonfly. So everybody's familiar with most insects having compound eyes. And this one you can actually see up, you can see up there, um, and let me do a little bit, the, the, the individual facets that make up the large compound eyes on either side of the head. However, dragonflies being so weird, you can also see the other three eyes that this animal has that most people don't realize. So looking above what looks like his nose, if this were a mammalian face, that little bulb sticking out above that is yet another eye. And then the two little bulbs that are paired just above and <coughs> either side of that are also eyes. So if you've ever wondered how dragonflies have the ability to change speed and direction so quickly, and how they seem to know things are happening just before they happen, this is how. These are eyes that are connected directly to the muscular system. So this animal can change direction without ever having thought about it, just based on what the eye has picked up. Again, we take pictures of things that are mating just because it happens out there. Uh, these are uh, wandering gliders. This was taken out of the web. And how do you get a picture of dragonflies mating on the wing when they're zipping by you very fast? You just happen to be that lucky. Uh, this is a matter of just being out there a lot and seeing what's happening. Very common little animal. This is one of the bluets. I don't know which bluet this is, but there are several species here that are all very similar. They're all in the genus Enolagma. And Enolagma, some of them are blue, some of them are not. This one is a male, as you can demonstrate by his bright blue coloration. The female would be much duller in coloration. These things are tiny and they're super easy to overlook. Uh, if we walked outside right now, I'll bet we could find in the grass some bluets or some dashers or some dancers, some type of little damselflies that most people would never pay any attention to because some of them are only an inch long and they're very thin body and you just don't see them all that well. But if you get down and look for these kinds of things, you'll see that there's a lot of places where you can take some amazing photos of stuff where somebody would have realized there was no photo at all. That's your look. Getting up a little bit closer with one. This one is a dancer in the Argia genus. And this one actually happens to have her mouth open. So you can see that that's the last thing that a lot of very small insects would see as they go down into that gullet. These things are amazing predators, just like their big cousins, the dragonflies. You just don't know the stuff that's happening out there if you're not paying attention. Now this one, on the other hand, is a little bit easier to spot. This is the nymph of a giant katydid. Giant katydids grow to about four, four and a half inches long, very large and leaf-like. It's definitely our biggest katydid species. This nymph alone is about three inches and bigger than most of the other katydids that are out there. You have to look for them a little bit because they are green on green, but they, they have a way of reflecting back light in a flashlight 
that a lot of other things don't. So they don't quite look like foliage when you see them in a light. And that's one of my tricks for finding insects at night is using a high power flashlight. It's, uh, it's bright enough that if we had a fully dark room here and we shined it on the roof, we'd be able to see uh, what we were doing pretty well. So having a bright, bright flashlight is the key to finding a lot of these things out there at night now. And like I said before, if you have nothing else in focus but the eyes, that photo still works. In this photo, because of the size of the insect, there's really nothing in focus but the eyes, but it still works in the photo. Okay. This is a short-winged green grasshopper. I like to take portraits of grasshoppers. You know, you see a lot of photos from the side. The photos from the side are great, again, as identifier photos. But seeing it from the front gives it much more character, much more personality, much more individuality. And it's not what people expect in an insect. But when you look at them this way, and he's not actually looking at me with his pupils focused like that. That's just a trick of the light. Like everything else out there, insect, he has compound eyes. So he's not actually focusing forward on me. It sure looks like he is, doesn't it? For a second, it's almost like you can't see him at all, right? A southern green striped grasshopper. I'm sure you guys have had the experience where you're walking along and you suddenly spook up a grasshopper and he flies and then he lands and then you can't find it at all. It just disappears. This is one of those species that does that. There's probably I'm going to say about 15 different species that are similar to that in what they do. That they fly and spook and then just vanish. But this one is probably the most effective at, at least in a grassy area, because he has more green coloration on it. Most of the others are brown, drab, gray, but this one is really good at hiding. And he was so convinced that he was good at hiding that he let me crawl within about eight inches of him before he flew again. Again, on my belly for this photo. But if you think he's good at hiding, this is a seaside grasshopper. Um, it took a lot of patience to get directly above him without him flying away to take this photo, but I think it's worth it because it shows off what fantastic camouflage they have. If you didn't know there was a grasshopper, you definitely wouldn't know there was a grasshopper. Everybody recognizes him, right? One that we all love to hate, right? So that's your Eastern lover. And you know, I, I used to kill these things a lot. Um, my aunt is a gardener, my grandmother is a gardener, and they hated these things. And they told me that the only thing you can do with a lover is kill them because they're gonna make millions more lovers out there. And yeah, they do eat some plants, and yeah, some plants they'll eat them down the nose. But I have not had a plant die because of lover grasshopper. And I also haven't found that not killing them has caused them to be overrunning my yard or my neighborhood. So I stopped killing them a long time ago. Um, this one is a teeny tiny, brand newly hatched first instar nymph. Um, and this was shot with that second rig that I showed with the longer micro lens. And it's sharp enough that if I zoom in on it, you can see the, the facets on his eyes. And it's something that, again, fits on a thumbnail. So, but again, like this, he seems to have a little bit more personality than when you just see a tiny little grasshopper hopping around and he's going to pop his head off. So one of the weirder uh, grasshopper species that we have down here, this is a long-headed toothpick grasshopper. These are a little harder to spot. They don't do as much hopping as they do maybe just a little short a lot of grasshoppers will jump and you'll see them jump a foot or two. This guy doesn't do that. This guy jumps maybe two or three inches. And then the other thing he'll do is, unlike most grasshoppers, he'll hide down in the grass. So instead of trying to hop to get away from you, he'll almost bury into the thatch to disappear. And he does a fantastic job of it because he blends in very well. He's got a shape that makes it a lot harder to spot him. These guys occur in both brown and green colored forms. Most of the ones I've seen are brown around here, but up a little bit further north into DeSoto County, I see a lot of the green ones. 
I don't know what drives them to be one color phase or another in a particular area. I just know that that's what I see. Anybody recognize that? Green lights. Squash red. I don't know if that's a leaf or possibly. So, even though you might not recognize them by looking at it, I'm sure you recognize this sound. The crickets that we hear out, out at night, most of those crickets are not the common house crickets that we're used to seeing that are down the ground level. They're tree crickets of various types. And this is one of them. This is one of the green trigs. I don't know which species this is. It's in the genus Cercoxifa, but as far as identifying the species, again, very difficult to do. But this is a nocturnal, very small green cricket that lives in trees. You will not see them very often. This one was in a shrub at about head height, which is an unusual place for them to be, but that shrub is also under a tree, so I think he might have gotten shaken out of the tree and had to make his way back up into it then. So these are small insects that have big voices. We all hear them out there. Don't mistake it for the cicadas. Cicadas are the really loud ones. These guys are the chirp, chirp, chirps. And here's another species of tree cricket. This one is a Fulton's brown trig. Fulton's brown trig is, again, a very small animal, less than an inch long. This one is fully adult and very capable of not only flying, but also making a lot of noise. I see these more frequently now around the lights at night than I used to. I don't know if our population number has gone up or if there's some other reason that they would be more attracted to lights, but I'm definitely seeing them a lot more than I did a few years back. Personality plus insects, the mantises. And a lot of people are freaked out by them, a lot of people can't stand them. Personally, I'm just deeply fascinated by these things. And I wish I saw more of them, but whenever I see one, I try to uh, take any photos I can get a chance to. This one is a Carolina mantis, and it's a female. You can tell it's a female because she's fat. Sorry, ladies, but that's just how it is with these insects. She's got wings that don't quite reach down to cover the end of her abdomen. And while she can flutter them, she can't fly them. She weighs too much, unfortunately. But she needs that large body because she's going to develop a huge clutch of eggs, which is going to be next year's Carolina mantises. So she needs to be able to carry as many as possible. Okay, we don't get to see the male Carolina mantis. I'm sorry. Grizzled mantis demonstrating its excellent camouflage. Now again, this is a perfectly fine photo. There's nothing wrong with this photo. We can identify immediately what this animal is. But if you want to take a personality photo, getting out in front of that animal is going to be your much better bet. So mantises usually will stick around and let you work with them, especially if they're females and they can't fly away. And they don't have as much fear of humans as they probably should. So this animal let me take probably 300 photos of her, and she posed very interesting for quite a few of them. But this is the cream of the crop. Looks rather coquettish. <laughs> exactly, right? It seems like nobody likes spiders. But jumping spiders just have that little fuzzy teddy bear look to them. And this one being tiny and cute, this is one of the paradise jumping spiders in the genus Habermatus. I don't know which species again. And I mean, that's a blade of grass. So this is not a large animal. This is something that you're not going to see unless you get down low and you start looking for them. So this one was literally found by, again, just laying in the grass and looking for whatever might be in front of it. So, digging around sometimes, and it goes without saying that being a jumping spider, this thing is completely harmless. And it didn't bite you even if you got the chance at it. This is one of the flower crab spiders in the genus Mikafisa. If you spend time around by this album looking for the insects, eventually you're going to realize that these spiders are reasonably common in those flowers. You do see them occasionally on other species, but the Biden seems to be by far their top choice. And 
That's why I see the overwhelming majority of these spiders. They are not big. You can see it's perching on a petal, and this is close to adult size. They do get a little bit bigger. A lot of times they'll also be on the underside of the petal, and you may see just a leg sticking out. Um, if you look around the thistles, you'll see the same thing happening with green leaf spiders, where they'll hang around underneath the leaf and you'll just see a leg kind of wrapped around the top. So if you pay attention, you may spot some of these spiders out there. But these are, again, very harmless little spiders. If they recognize that you've approached, they'll drop down to the ground and you'll never see them again. They want nothing whatsoever to do with you. You're just waiting for something to come along and try to take a sip from this flower. And it's amazing the size of the prey that these things will jump on. Uh, we'll see them occasionally with insects that are more than twice their size. Uh, I have seen photos, not photos that I took, of spiders about this size with full-size uh, sulfur butterflies. So they can take remarkably large prey. I'm not sure how they keep that prey from flying away with them still attached, but it seems to work out. <coughs> not all of them are gonna have that patterning on them. This is another Mecophysa, and might be a different species, it's hard to tell, that has absolutely no coloration on her whatsoever. And this is a very typical hunting posture where she's ready to, ready to hug is what she's doing. So somebody come along and give her a hug because that's what she needs. This is an orchard orb weaver, one of our more common small orb weaver species. They like shady areas. They'll build in a web that's approximately three to five feet across. And a lot of people will mistake these for widow spiders because they have that orange red marking on the underside of the abdomen. But as you can see, it's not an hourglass, it's more like an eye shape. And she's a totally long body shape for a widow spider anyway. Plus widows don't have those pretty blues and greens on them. And widows don't usually build nests the way this one does. Again, a skittish spider, if it feels or sees you approach, it'll drop straight down to the ground and you'll probably never see it again. You probably have these in your How big are these uh, tiny? Orchard orb weavers? Yeah. Um, maybe up to about an inch and a half across the legs, but most of them are going to be quite a bit small. Now, here's a spider that you probably don't have in your yard. Um, this one is one of the Sergiola spiders. I don't know which species this is. They're very difficult to identify. This one was also found on a hike out of the web. Does anybody recognize that plant? It's, um, I call them matchsticks. I'm not quite sure what it is, but that's kind of what they look like to me. They're little matchstick head plants that grow out of the ground. Um, they're not real tall, and you certainly don't usually see spiders on them, and I've never seen one of these before or since. But again, just paying attention to what's happening in front of you, and sometimes you see something that's like, hey, look at you. I tried to identify this spider a couple of times and not been successful with it. I don't even know what family this spider is in. I just know that he's sitting out on the tip of a leaf, which I'll get on a minute tall fall leaf. I remember that much. And he's actively spinning a web. What he's doing is he's got his spinnerets up in the air and he's spinning out silk, which is being caught by a passing breeze. This is how spiders are able to spin webs across impossibly wide gaps because they will let the breeze do the work for them. So if you just make a little parachute at the end of your line and then set it sail in the direction that you wanted it to go, you can carry a web line a long, long ways. And then once you've got one, then you can make the rest of them. So that's what this guy is in the process of doing. So that leaf, is Caesar weed, and you may recognize that that's a very, very tiny insect sitting at the end of that Caesar weed. If you look at Caesar weed leaves, a lot of times you'll notice that they have tracks. It looks like something has been almost mining through the leaf, and what that is is the larvae of this tiny little fly. This is a let's see now, American serpentine leaf mite. And I see them a lot on Caesar weeds, but I'm sure they go after other species as well. And they're teeny tiny little yellow flies. If you're paying attention and looking for something small around the Caesar weeds, you'll see these. 
and you'll also see a lot of the long-legged flies, which are bright metallic greens or blues. Uh, pretty common animals out there, but not very big. Most people miss them. Now this one is even smaller. This is one of the plant hoppers. Uh, I think it's Bothria cognita. It almost looks like a cicada on a very small scale, and that's kind of what it is. Looked at from above, it almost looks like a very small moth because it has widespread wings. But looked at from the side, it's just this little tiny plant hopper, plant hopper bug. Has anybody ever heard that adult crane flies don't eat? So it's a common thing that's, that's passed around among naturalists for years. That adult crane flies don't ever eat, they only eat in their larval forms. Here are some crane flies they're eating. So if you want to say it, you can, but now you have evidence that, that that's not true. Some people call them mosquitoes. Yes. They call them mosquito ears. They call them, some people think they are mosquitoes. They think it's a giant mosquito. Um, which they're not. And they don't eat mosquitoes at all. And they are vegetarian. And here they are with a little bit of, uh, a little bit of turkey. For this photo, I not only was on my belly, I was on my belly in the middle of the road. So, <laughs> this is a robber fly. Uh, he has a fun name to say. It's Proctocampus fulvodentus. This is, if, you, if you're walking on a sandy trail and you have a large fuzzy headed fly land in front of you and then suddenly take off again, there's a good chance that this was him. Uh, probably one of the most noticed robber flies in our area but only because they have that tendency that they want to land on roads and sandy trails and they're also large. We have probably a dozen species of robber flies out here that you'll see in other locations if you look for them. All of them are predators. Occasionally you'll see one carrying around another insect and it just suck the juice right out. You don't want to get eaten by a robber fly. It's a bad way to go. This is a rice bug, uh, the genus Spinochorus. Uh, again, I'll show you that if you have the eye, then you have the photo, and if you don't, then you don't have anything. Uh, so, related to stink bugs, but not stinky, and an unusual insect that I don't see very often, especially during the daytime. Very occasionally I'll see them attracted to lights at night, but this is one of maybe two or three times that I've seen them out during the day. We have a bazillion species of flies. This one, is Cenosia tigrina, and what it does, I couldn't tell you, but they have many, many different forms of life. We, we are familiar with the house flies and flesh flies that lay their eggs on trash or on dead things, and the maggots will start crawling through, and it makes your skin crawl too. But there's a lot of different ways for flies to make their lifestyle, and not all of them do things that are nearly so disgusting. So don't judge all flies based on how some. Uh, this is a rattle pod, seed pod. Uh, it has not gone dark yet, so it doesn't rattle at this point. And those tiny, tiny little things on it are stink bug ants. I don't know which species they are. It's hard to identify the species when they're this young. We do have a lot of non-native stink bugs out there that have been moved around by agriculture. Whether this is one of the native or non-native species, I couldn't tell you. A flea beetle sitting at the end of a blade of grass. Uh, I was attracted to the bright orange color from about five feet away. So again, if you're looking for, you are likely to see. Now I was expecting to find maybe one of those flower crab spiders when I found this guy. This is an unusual insect in an unusual color. Uh, Harmostes reflexulus, again a relative of a stink bug, but not a stink bug. And usually these guys are brown and green, but this particular individual is white, which is a rarer color form. And you don't see these very often anyway, so to see this rare bug in this rare color form was way more exciting for me than probably is for you. Is anybody familiar with ambush bugs? 
They're interesting little creatures. If you look closely, those club-like front legs are very similar to the grasping legs of a praying mantis. And they are definitely killers. They, again, will take large insects, many times larger than themselves, but right now they're a little busy with something else. So, I see these occasionally sitting on top of flowers in the same types of areas where I'll see the flower crab spiders, but these seem to prefer larger yellow flowers, whereas the crab spiders are usually in small white flowers. These are cell phone picks. So this is the red banded hair streak. Uh, this one has had his wings a little bit beaten up, so he's had a couple of predation attempts happen. As you can see, he's still going strong, so his trick has worked and he's continuing to use it. By accident, we have a couple of flies here in the photo as well, just because they happen to be around that area. Now you can see that this photo is not quite as clear and clean and sharp as we have from the dedicated cameras. And that's to be expected. But we still are able to see what we're dealing with quite plainly. We still can make a good identification of the species. And if we take our time with it, we still can get a reasonably good photo. Maybe not one that you would always want to project six feet high, but still, it's not a terrible photo. Mm -hmm. This is that little tiny red-waisted chlorella moth moth that we saw earlier. Again, a very small insect, and we were able to get a decent photo of it even with the cell phone. One of our skippers, this is a fiery skipper, and these are all cell phone picks going forward, by the way. This was taken in my mother's backyard. Yes? So are you away and zooming in on it to get it more clear, or do you get as close as you can and get it full size or whatever? So the problem with getting as close as you can in this kind of situation, when I'm just putting a lens out towards them, they're a little bit less spooked of that than they are my hand. Putting your hands that close toward an insect is challenging. So you kind of have to know the bug that you're dealing with and what the likelihood is of it steering away from it. So it's a mix of things. When you zoom in more, then your photos are going to be less sharp than if you zoomed in less. So we will have some here where I'm using almost no zoom. Uh, and I'll show you which ones they are specifically. When you're dealing with flying insects that are likely to out of there, then yeah, you might want to use a little bit of zoom just to make sure that you get the photo at all. And what I'll usually do is I'll take photos, and I do this with the camera too, I take photos from farther away and then I progressively move closer. So that way I have a shot no matter what. So even if it flies away, then at least I have a photo that proves that I saw it. And there's a good reason for me to have that photo, which I'll show you here shortly. But I try to get as good a photo as I can, which means that I'm progressively getting closer closer and closer until it actually leaves. And are you just using the auto settings? Yep. Yeah, depending on your particular phone, you may wish to use some different settings and some phones will have macro settings that you can use. Um, when I take photos of insects around lights at night, then I do use a manual setting on my phone uh, and I'll share those settings with you. Another skipper, this one is a satchel. Uh, fast little guys, and I'm surprised that I got that photo because they usually dart away, but this one just wasn't quite so willing to run, so it kind of stayed there and they let me get close to it. Cool. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, I caught this one, it hit me. Uh, this is one of the horse flies. Uh, not quite as bad as the yellow flies, but I, I was driving down the web with my windows down and he flew in and he bit one of the young son and all did. Oh, so <laughs> that's all right. He is he is deceased in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> this one was really easy to get close to. <laughs> this is a hieroglyphic cicada nymph. A lot of times you'll see these just the exuvia, the cast off shell, when they've uh, grown out of that and moved into the adult stage. This one is actually just climbed up out of the ground and is headed up the tree in order to do that. Uh, I would have liked to have stuck around and taken some photos of that, but I did not have the time that day, unfortunately, so this is the best that we've got. Uh, I've only seen that happen a few times, and I still haven't got a good photo of one of them. So, 
Why do they stop? This is a palm flatted plant hopper. Uh, again, a very small insect that you know, most people would notice the little green dot, and that would be it. You wouldn't notice the, the bright uh, orange and blue colors on it unless you get up real close to it. And a lot of times, the photography actually helps us get a better view of it than you can get with your eye. So even just zooming in with your cell phone camera sometimes will let you see details that you otherwise would completely miss. This is a compact carpenter ant, not the big ones that you see out there, the mid-size ant. Fire ant, not the full size carpenter ant. This is the medium sized guy. If you park your vehicle close to trees, this is the one that likes to get inside of your vehicle and hang out in there. I do not know what kind of fly he's got, but it's a fly and it's dinner for later. We talked about trigs earlier and we looked at a Fulton's pol trig. This one is a much rarer animal called a Calusa trig. Uh, I went to go get my camera to take a better photo of this animal, but it was gone by the time I got back. So that's another thing that I'll do, is I'll quickly take a snap, just as a voucher photo to prove that I did in fact see the thing, um, whether that's to prove it to somebody else or to prove it to myself for later, doesn't really matter. But I went to go get the camera and it was gone. But at least I had this photo, which proves that it existed. And we were in the same area together. Now this one, this is an ivory marked borer, and this is an animal that was attracted to lights at night. So I'm using a manual setting on my cell phone to take this picture. And if anybody is interested in knowing what those settings are, I'm shooting at ISO 250. My speed is 1 1 25th of a second. My focus is set to center flash is on. Now depending on your particular phone, you may have more or fewer settings that you can utilize in manual mode. And some phones don't have manual mode. So I don't know what to tell you about that other than just take the best photo you can. But this photo also was tweaked a little bit in my phone's app that lets you tweak photos just to bring the colors back to what I actually saw that day. Because Ivory mark borers really do have these ivory yellow colored markings, but it didn't come out on the cell phone. So I needed to go back in and add a little bit of color to it so that it looked like what it looked like in real life. And that's something that I do frequently with my photos. Now, a lot of people will say, well, it's Photoshop. Well, of course it's Photoshop. You know, if you don't make your image look like what it originally looked like, then you don't have an image that's as good a quality as it could be. So what was the background on that one? On this, yeah. that is a stucco wall. So he's dead? No, he is very much alive. He is, oh. he is sitting on the side of that wall, okay. having been attracted to a light at night. I see. And he is just sitting there. This one's doing the same thing. This one is a seed bug. Uh, I'm not sure which species of seed bug it is, but it's another one of those photos that I like because it's two insects in one. If you look up close, you can see the oddly white colored little plant hopper that has landed on his head. So if you want to you can like pull yourself out of the shot to shadow. Sure you could. Yeah. Sure you could. You can do anything that you want to do with these images. You know, it, there's, there's a difference between photography and photojournalism. If I take a photo for the newspaper, that's photojournalism. And I need to keep that photo as much like what actually happened as possible. So if I've got my camera and I take a picture of Cliff here of the crowd, then I need to keep all of you in it and whatever facial expression you have. Now on the other hand, if it's photography and you want to look the best that you can, then I can go in and I can tweak everybody in Photoshop. I can remove wrinkles or add them, depending on whether you want to look older or younger. I can make it look like you're smiling a little bit. I can add a little rosy glow to your cheeks. And you can do the same thing to all of these photos, depending on what your goals are. You know, I, I usually go for a natural look, but a natural look doesn't always necessarily mean exactly what the camera captured. What it means is, what do I remember having seen? Some people don't like to see the predatory stuff, but when you're dealing with the insect world, you're definitely gonna have some of that out there. This is a red bull assassin bug, and he's caught himself a beetle. 
Um, again, it's going to liquefy the interior of that needle and it's going to suck it up through this straw-like mouth. So, not the most pleasant way to go, but that's just how it is in the bug world. This is a great wall jumping spider. It's caught itself a little tired on the fly. And this is the first photo that I took, and I said, you know what, I think I can do a little bit better. I can get more personality out of that guy. So, <laughs> taking that second photo, we all relate better to faces. So, this shows something happening. This shows predator and prey. It shows an interesting relationship. This shows the individual. This shows more of a corporate style. Now, lest you think that you have to have the fanciest phone and the sharpest eyesight in order to take these photos, this next series of photos is taken by my friend Robert Lukowitz. Do any of you know Robert? Robert does the radio show with me. Robert is the manager of Fish and Franks in Port Charlotte. And Robert is also legally blind. What I'm saying is, if he can do it, so can you. Monarch butterfly, of course. This is a Saronis blue, which he had never seen a Saronis blue before I started showing him how to find little things. And now he sees them all the time. So he's become slightly obsessed with trying to take photos of them. This is his best effort so far, which I have to say, for a blind guy with only a cell phone, it's pretty damn good. This is a female scarlet skimmer. You may be familiar with the males, which have a bright red coloration. The girls have to be do with this ugly straw coloring, but it's probably better because they're less likely to get spotted and they're more likely to be able to successfully reproduce. So the males are visible, but they get. We haven't been able to identify this praying mantis, but just a matter of we might get. What are your sources when you try to identify them? We'll get there. Settle down. <laughs> Does anybody recognize the gold preliminary caterpillar? So he's had a bunch of gold preliminaries in his yard lately. That's a passion flower leaf being devoured. This is one that a lot of people hate, hate, hate. Anybody recognize that bug? This is a citrus root beetle. So this is a major pest to the citrus industry. High in latex, pinky nail size beetles. They're pretty though. I have not been able to identify this spider. Uh, this photo was taken in Costa Rica. It may be one of the trapdoor spiders, but I'm not sure. How about that one? You like that one better? <laughs> a tarantula in the Arizona desert. Apparently this is a common behavior for them to stand up like this and uh, be as threatening as possible. So that's right on the edge of his booty. Now, this may not count as, a, as an insect photo. This is a, a uh, green and black poison dart frog, again taken in Costa Rica. But if you think it doesn't, well, you're wrong. It is an insect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk identification. <laughs> so, it is going to be difficult for you to know what you're shooting. And sometimes you'll be able to identify things fairly well. You'll at least know that it's a dragonfly or a damselfly or a spider or something like that. But if you want to identify to species, or at least as close as possible, here are some resources that will help you do that. Uh, everybody's on Facebook, I presume? The whole world is on Facebook. This is a Facebook group that has numerous very knowledgeable members that this is what they do all the time, help people identify creepy crawlies and reptiles here in Florida. Um, you'll find a lot of different identification groups out there. This one is one of the best by far. It is very knowledgeable administrators. Uh, I've had a lot of animals that I thought were one thing and turned out to be something completely else, and they've helped to educate me quite a bit. And not only that, but you can also scroll through and see other people's things that they have posted for identification. So that will help you learn what you're dealing with out there. 
Now, of course, it being a Facebook group, occasionally some random moron will pop up and say, this is that, when it's completely not that. But they usually get shut down pretty quick by the admins and do their very best here to have only accurate answers. So this is a fantastic group. If you have any interest at all in insects or reptiles here, you definitely should join this group. And so if you look for some IDs, creepy crawlies and reptiles of Florida identification. This is another good group that will help you to identify things. Florida entomology. Obviously, they're not as much with the creepy crawlies and reptiles, but the bugs they're pretty good with. Uh, they also are useful with spiders. And again, scroll through it and you'll see a lot of animals identified that will help you get a feel for the species that you're likely to come across out here. Of course, Florida is huge. A lot of the species that they see in North Florida, we don't see here in Southwest Florida. There are species in the Keys in Miami that we don't see here. So there's going to be some that you don't come across, but a lot of them will become familiar to you if you're spending time looking for this stuff. Now, if you don't like to be interactive with other people, or you don't like asking people questions, or you just hate Facebook, you can go to bugguide.net. Uh, bugguide.net has a huge number of species here. It is, however, not the most user-friendly website that I've ever seen. So you can mess around here. There's a lot of information to be found here. Very frequently, the members of Florida Entomology and Creepy Crawlies page will actually refer you back to here in order to show you the identifications of the animals that they're pointing out to you. But you being able to go to Bug Guide and get good IDs on your own is challenging just because, like I say, it's not the most user-friendly site out there. This one, on the other hand, is extremely user-friendly. This is insectidentification.org. The downside to this is that it's geared more toward the casual user. There are a lot of missing species here. There are a lot of species that you'll find that are similar to the species that we have, but not quite the species. And that's partly because there just are so many different insects out there. You know, like I said, if you're dealing with dragonflies, well, there's probably close to 100 different species of dragonflies in Florida. Some of which are common, some of which are rare, some of which will look like other species, some of which you're never going to see no matter how hard you look. So getting absolute positive identification is hard. There's also iNaturalist. Is anybody here not using iNaturalist? feel like some of you aren't using iNaturalist, but you don't want to raise your hand. <laughs> iNaturalist utilizes an AI to help you identify your finds out there. And it's not just useful for insects, it's useful for pretty much anything that you find out there. Uh, this is my iNaturalist observations page. As you can see, I have 1,202 observations in just insects, 485 different species. All of that here in Southwest Florida. And I've just barely scratched the surface of being able to find what's out there. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of species here. It usually will give you some suggestions for what your photo is. Often, if you have a clear photo of a relatively common animal, it will get it right. If you have a photo that's only so-so, or if it's a fairly rare animal, then it will often get it wrong. However, there are a lot of other users on iNaturalist who will come along and hopefully be able to help you out with that. So I posted some things that I had no idea what they were and then gotten some great feedback from people to help me identify what they were going forward. It's fantastic and not only that, but you're contributing to a citizen science project because your observations which you're posting with location data and with dates are helping to determine what we're seeing in terms of changes in range, changes in seasonal activity. Uh, a lot of that being driven by climate change, but a lot of it being driven by uh, things like non-native species showing up and making our native species change their behaviors or the places or the times that they do things. So all of that data is being fed into this project, which is helping them have a better understanding of what's going on in our natural world. And just to point out, my iNaturalist also has 840 observations of 351 species of plants. So while I'm not necessarily a plant guy, I do try. I 
okay? I'm doing the best I can. And that's it. That's all I got. Is that iNaturalist.org.com or what? Um, you know, it's on Facebook or it's on But if you just Google iNaturalist, yeah, it's gonna, it actually it's website. Yeah, you have a website and app. Yes, there, both of them are available. The app is not quite as fully featured as the website is, and it does not allow you to do some of the things that the website will. But it's very convenient when you're out in the field to snap photos with your phone and then just upload them to the app, and in many cases get an almost immediate identification of what's going on. Does anybody have any other questions? Other discussion points? Yes. Yeah, um, sweat, sweat, sweat bees? Sweat bees, yeah. Do they um, like the leaves of the snag uh, group? Or that's a, that's a I haven't noticed them doing that. I've never really seen them in mangrove habitat. Uh, I usually see them uh, the most common places around patches of vines. And they're not just going after the salt, of course, they're going to take pollen and they're going to take nectar as well. So I don't know if perhaps if there was mangroves in an area where they also had some flowers that they could utilize, that they might go to both. Uh, I've personally never seen them around mangroves, nor have I heard of that happening. But it seems like a logical hypothesis. Yes? What sparked your interest in what got you started doing this? Um, I've always been kind of a, a nature nerd. Um, even when I was in elementary school, I had the full collection of Audubon uh, guidebooks. So I've just always been interested in it. But really, it's, it started with an interest in fish. Having aquariums and going fishing when I was a kid and seeing the weird things that would come up with the bait that you were catching or sometimes the odd fish that you would catch that people couldn't identify. And it made me realize that there was a lot of stuff out there that we didn't know that much about. And then, of course, I couldn't go fishing every day, so then you start paying more attention to the things that are around you, the other animals. So sometimes the plants, if they were showy enough, but more likely the butterflies. And that's the other thing that got me started there, was I was a butterfly collector uh, all through middle school. Um, I got picked on for a little bit because while other kids were drawing Superman and race cars, I was drawing Tiger Swallows mostly. So, but you know, it's okay. You deal with that kind of stuff, you get through it. And somewhere I still have some micro maps with some of the butterflies I collected when I was in middle school. And then of course you can't pay attention to butterflies without noticing that there's other stuff out there too. And then you know, it's kind of, you follow rabbit holes and the rabbit holes lead you to all kinds of interesting places. Yes, ma'am. Do you have anything good to say about mosquitoes? Other than being food for birds and stuff? Well, mosquitoes are food for a lot of things. Um, they also are important pollinators, as a lot of people don't realize. Male mosquitoes don't bite you. Male mosquitoes don't eat a lot of food. But what do male mosquitoes eat? In some cases, they're eating plant juices, but in other cases, they're also taking nectar. Female mosquitoes will take nectar and plant juices as well. And anything that feeds on nectar is going to be a pollinator. And because of their size and shape, they're going to have access to flowers that other animals are going to have a hard time getting to. So if you were to take mosquitoes completely out of the environment, they're probably the main pollinators for at least some plant species. And then you have other animals that are going to be dependent on those plant species, and you probably start to unravel another little piece of the web by not realizing the other things that mosquitoes do. Are they my favorites? No, they're not my favorites. <laughs> but I have a policy that applies to mosquitoes and ticks and horse flies and all of those groups that want to drink my blood, which is that if you attempt to take it, I will kill you. <laughs> if you don't, then we're cool. So as long as you're over there, then I'm not gonna bother you. Just about mosquitoes. I don't know about mosquitoes in Florida much, but I know about them in New Jersey. There are 32 species of mosquitoes in New Jersey. Five of them bite you. There's only five out of 32 that will bite you. Four of those five are non-native. They were brought in. So the, the one that fought, hit me as a kid, the marsh mosquito, is still around. But the other ones that have come in, that are in Florida as well, the other ones. So we're, you know, we're kind of giving mosquitoes 
Right. More credit for being nasty than they really deserve. Yeah. And although all female mosquitoes do want blood, not all of them are willing to take it from a warm water animal. So you'll see if you, if you look at, like, for example, the two to three frogs that you have around your lights at night, uh, I didn't include that picture in the slide, but I have a photo of a human tree frog zoomed in on his eye where there's a little mosquito right here biting him across the tongue because that's a species that doesn't want anything to do with you and me. It wants cold water. Mm -hmm. It could swat him. Well, I mean, technically the frog could swat too. He's got a paw. Yeah. <laughs> So then, what about, how do you feel about all the spray that we get a couple of times a year? I mean, like this. Yeah, I'm not a big fan. No. I understand why they do it, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm the fifth generation. I got to hear the stories when I was a kid of how bad the bugs were down here before any of them did anything about it. But people survived, you know, people lived through that, and was there malaria? Sure, there was malaria. We can deal with that now without having bugs. It's more of a convenience factor though. And it, it causes more damage ecologically speaking than people recognize. So, so you know it's a very mixed feeling. You know, you know on the one hand yeah I can go into areas in central Florida that are remote enough that they don't do any mosquito spraying and the number of bugs out there can be kind of terrifying. Right? Um, on the other hand I, I'd rather see a whole ecology than one that has pieces taken out of it. Yeah. So. Yes, please. Some of them go to the You may. No, you. I thought you had something for just a second. It's a little harder with no seams. Um, you know, for a long time, I was told that no seam larvae were an important food source for juvenile carpet. Um, Having looked into it a little bit deeper, no seam larvae live in mud. Uh, they do live in shallow stagnant water, but shallow enough that I don't think that there's any chance that baby tarpon are going to get there. Um, this is not a very positive thing that I'm saying about no seam so far. Uh, surely, though, there are other animals that are dependent on them because you can't live in the wild and not have predators. Um, they certainly feed a lot of dragonflies and damselflies, I can tell you that much. So, and it's an easy prey for them because they're slow. So, whether they do anything else that would get people excited, I don't know what I can tell you here. <laughs> anything else, guys? Yes. I noticed that dragonflies disappeared and I'm just wondering if that's going to be So, dragonflies have an aquatic larval form. Um, they tell us that it, it doesn't affect anything else, that what they're spraying is mosquito specific and that that's all that it's going to kill. Uh, I don't really believe that. <laughs> I have a hard time with accepting that it's only going to kill mosquitoes because, I mean, let's face it, that's a fairly broad range of insect. You've got dozens of species out there, and I don't know how you can say we found something in mosquitoes and only mosquitoes going to be affected by this toxic substance. It seems unlikely. So yeah, I think it probably is killing some other aquatic insects out there. It wouldn't surprise me if at least some species of dragonflies and damselflies are affected. Whether it would affect all species, I don't know. It could account for some of the changes that we've seen in our diversity in those animals, where some species suddenly become more abundant and others become much less abundant or even almost disappear. So you may have some that are affected more by the chemicals and some that are less. This stuff is all subject to someone actually doing a study on it though. And there's very little interest in doing studies on that because if we found that it was actually killing the dragonflies, we'd have to find another solution. So in some cases, it's kind of better to just close your eyes to that situation and say, Nope, it only killed the spear, and we already know that. So, case closed. Let's look over here now. Um, I understand that they're setting mosquitoes free or in, in the keys that have been, I don't know if it's irradiated, but they they mate and then the, they can't produce egg 
eggs or something. Right, they're like producing that. sterile males. Sterile, that's and it. And sterile males are mating with females, and I think that's probably a better solution okay. than putting out the toxic chemicals, yeah. which have unknown consequences, and right. which once they start to break down in the environment, the breakdown products have unknown consequences. Uh, if we have to control mosquitoes, that's probably a better solution. However, it's also a much more expensive solution. So it's it's more difficult for people to accept that. And as is being pointed out, you have to do it for each species that you want to control. And not all species will have the same mating strategy, so it may not work as well for some species as it does for others. So different species of mosquitoes? Yes. Uh -huh. Any pictures? I didn't see any pictures of ant lions once they emerge from the ground. Apparently, they're kind of like a dragonfly. It's a little bit like a dragonfly, but they keep their wings folded. Do you have any pictures of those? Uh, I probably have a couple pictures somewhere on my phone, but where I'm able to find them, I don't know. Um, it's kind of difficult to dig through. So, uh, but they are interesting animals, and they will bite you as adults if you go out and catch them. Uh, again, that's one that I usually see around lights at night. So there's also owl flies and fish flies, which are similar to ant lions and sometimes mistaken for them, and also will bite you if you get bit. Hmm. Yes? Did you say you belong to a herpetology group, or is there a herpetology group? Not that I know of. Um, there are a couple of herb-oriented groups, but they're more oriented towards captive animals than wild ones. So when we go herping, I go with a couple of friends or I go on my own. Um, it's more just some individuals getting together rather than any kind of organized group. If you head out west towards Arizona and California, you do find some field herping groups. If you're looking for somebody to do some field herping with, there are field herping groups on Facebook, a couple of which are Florida focused, but uh, as far as being able to steer you towards one, I couldn't do that because I'm not a part of any of those groups. But I know they exist, and I know that people sometimes do find field herping buddies with that. If you're interested in doing some field herping, you know, basically the, the simplest way to do it is to drive around somewhere between say a half hour before sunset and about three hours after sunset. One of the easiest places to do it and a good excuse to go down there is Everglades National Park. So we're driving down Park Road, we found some really cool stuff down there. Uh, mangrove salt marsh snakes are one of our most common finds and those are always fun because you never know what you're going to get. You know, are you going to get one of the orange ones, one of the bright red ones, is it going to be one of the plain gray ones? Is it going to be one of the ones that looks almost like a banded water snake? You never know until you go out there and look. And that's also one of the places where we routinely find baby cotton balls. So. Yeah. Anything else? Guys? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks for having me. You can friend me on Facebook or you can even just follow me because all of my posts are public. Right now I'm mostly posting bird photos because that's mostly what I'm doing out there is bird watching because of the, the time of the year. But as the migratory birds start to leave, I'll certainly be doing some more insects and getting closer back into that. So you can check it out. And I try to post something every day. Uh, I don't get to point to it every single day. What's your last name, please? Olive. Olive. O-L-I-V-E. -E. Just like the ones that come in hand. Thank you.